today. So let's let's get started. Um, so again, a reminder that uh, there is no class obviously on Tuesday, and there will be a midterm on Thursday. Okay, and then we will send you more information regarding midterm, such as the um, like an exam, uh, um, a sample paper, etc. Before that, any questions before I get started? Okay. Um, so we were, the, as, a, as a quick reminder of where we were, we were basically uh, last class like this. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so in the last class, uh, we were basically changing, we started looking at using the um, uh, lifted representations, that is, representing states in terms of features, and uh, that got us to start talking about generalization. We had a whole entire long discussion about generalization and its discontents, and um, we talked about multiple reasons why you want to uh, generalize the value function in terms of features, um, both in terms of not enough training data and in terms of learning taking too long, and of course the most obvious one is memory, but that's the least important thing actually. The reason you generalize in reinforcement learning is just because you can generalize with much less amount of data, and so you can learn faster. Uh, and then we talked about uh, feature-based representations, approximate ideas of how they would look like, um, and then um, we talked about, this is actually a slide that I added after the class to summarize everything that was said uh, without a slide in the class. Um, in particular, that uh, I spent a bunch of time trying to explain to you that generalization is impossible if you do not have, uh, if you only have atomic representation. The whole entire thing about, if you guys are represented in terms of your social security number, then I can't generalize anything from there. Okay, I have to represent you in terms of some features. Um, and um, and then, then that I also pointed out that if you have feature based, uh, once you represent them in terms of feature based lifted at factor representations, then we can start generalizing. But it also actually means uh, there is a whole entire question of who decided how many features are supposed to be put for the um, states. And in fact, if I wound up uh, uh, deciding that the only thing that I care about uh, you is just yeah, you know the marks in the test, in the various marks in the test, then in essence, nothing else. There could be two individuals with two very different birth secret numbers who have the exact same marks in the test. So this is called state aliasing. So what were two completely different states in the real world became the same in terms of feature representation. Okay. Um, and this is something that will happen in general when you have feature-based representations. Now, there is a whole entire discussion about who does come up with features, factors for the states. Mostly in the beginning, we'll assume that uh, some designer comes up with the features uh, for the state. And in some particular cases, uh, such as an image recognition with deep learning, you may well essentially start from really completely raw data, such as the pixels. Um, and then try to learn features from there. But that is actually only true for some specific cases such as images or voice. Um, for example, if I have to decide something about your credit score, then I need to look at your entire life, not just a single picture, okay? So other than feature-based representation, the only other way I could really start from scratch is to have a space-time tube of your life. So essentially, images taken in your life every millisecond, and then use that to figure out what should be the real features. And that can be done in theory, but it's pretty much impossible in practice. So most people who basically say they use, for example, things like deep learning, um, wind up using hand-coded features. That is, some uh, designer gives the features. Which does bring up that question, I think somebody from there asked uh, last time, um, as to whether the, video, the, the specific features you use themselves might be introducing biases. That is indeed very much true. 
Okay, it's a particular way you decided to look at the state. So if I decide to represent all of you in terms of just the uh, set of marks on the various tests, then that's my bias. And that might be a reasonable bias for giving a grade in this course. But certainly that's not a good bias for some other um, you know, task. Okay, uh, so we looked at that too. And then we looked at um, uh, how basically uh, function approximation works. We looked at the difference between compression and learning, both of which are extremely close. Um, but in the case of compression, what you are interested in is losslessness on the training data. In the context of reinforcement learning, the training data lossness, losslessness means I have currently a value function. I want to somehow come up with a feature-based representation and a particular, you know, um, a particular function that takes the features and exactly predicts the values such that the predictions of the values agree with pretty much every state. So there is no error whatsoever in the existing value function. So in general, that's what you would, for example, do when you convert an image into a JPEG, um, where in a sense you're trying to reduce the error with respect to the original image um, data. In fact, JPEG is lossless or lossy. Do people know? Lossy. OK. So in fact, one of the nice things you can do is if you have very large text files, JPEG the heck out of them. Right? And that would be extremely lossy. Yeah. Right? Things like zip and um, you know, um, basically are lossless uh, compression schemes. And if you try to use things like zip on images, in essence, you don't get much of a compression. How many of you have tried to zip a, um, a, a, an image a, and found that it increases the size? Yeah. <laughs> right? Essentially, because there's, you know, the way in general compression works in things like text and so on, essentially is it considers the fact that there are many, many words that are being used with high frequencies. And the idea is to put a big, code table up front, saying the most frequently used word gets the shortest code. So in English, the will get probably like a single bit code. Okay, and the least frequently used ones will get longer codes. And if you do this, then in a sense, wherever they're supposed to be the, you just put this one bit. And then during the uncompression, you go back to this code table and say, oh, one means the. That's how you do compression. OK. Um, in general, for things like language, etc., there is this sort of a repetition. So it turns out in the space of words, you can actually do compression. But in images, that doesn't work because essentially the pixel values, there is no obvious way in which they repeat. So in fact, you'll wind up doing things like JPEG, which you won't get into here. But any compression algorithm can be seen as some sort of a dual of a learning algorithm. And if, you, if it's doing too good a compression, then it is actually a bad learning algorithm. Because learning is about future, not about past. OK, so although there are connections, uh, and that's why we actually spent a bunch of time about this training data versus error on the training data versus error on the test data. And as you drive down the error on the training data, in many cases, the error on the test data starts increasing. And that is because that's when you say you are overfitting to the noise in the training data. That's what we talked about, the overfitting. And in fact, this particular idea is called, this phenomenon is called bias variance trade-off from statistics. OK? Uh, so we looked at that too. And then, of course, um, we started talking about um, doing the actual value function approximation where value is a linear weighted sum of features where the weights are the thetas. You know, you could call them w's, but we wanted to call them thetas. And, uh, and then uh, we want to essentially, in, during the TD update, instead of the way we used to do before is we had a 17 in the uh, value function of the state. And the, you, know, you wind up doing a transition, find that you are next to uh, a neighbor who has 95 value. So based on the TD update, you want to update this guy's value from 17 to 19. 
In the atomic representation, you just go into that cell and cut out 17, put 19. Now you are not allowed to do that. Instead, you have to change these thetas such that for this particular, um, you know, this particular cell's value is nudged close to towards the neighbor. So in fact, you want to make this theta such that it becomes close to 19. Now the problem, of course, is in doing so, you wound up changing everybody else's value too. This is where we had this very long discussion, which I thought was amazingly connected, but probably you didn't, as to if I don't like one specific person in this class and I want them to get a bad grade, I can start changing the weights given to uh, the different um, you know, uh, assignments um, until their cumulative falls below some threshold, and then say, look, you have a low grade. Right? But when I do that, unfortunately, everybody else's grades also change. And the question, of course, is you can see this as a bug array feature. If I all care about is just basically doing this person, making this person get a bad grade, then this is a bug. If on the other hand, you know, I'm thinking of when I'm making the value change for this state, somehow that should change the values of all the other states that have similar features. <laughs> which is basically what we were hoping for when we were looking at uh, um, you know, this, this Pac-Man thing. I remember when, when you had this Pac-Man thing, you wanted to be able to say that this state and this state and this state, while they're completely different from an atomic perspective, are essentially very similar in terms of you know, where the Pac-Man is and where the um, uh, systems are. So, so that's basically what, so you can then think of that as a, um, in that case, if you view it that way, you will see it as, as a feature, essentially. Okay, so that's what we were saying here, that when you change the thetas, then other guys' values will also change. And that's the generalization. Now, in fact, again, this is why, in fact, I would like to think of generalization in general as it's, it can be seen as a feature or a bug. When I, gen when I generalize, I could actually be doing wrong things. Okay, and this is, you can't avoid that problem in general. But, you know, so this is what we're trying to do. And, you know, in, in trying to make the nudge, uh, of course, then we pointed out that what happened in, in what we did there was we made a, two major pivots. Um, one was to go from atomic to lift, uh, lifted state representations. Other is to go from discrete search in A star search, et cetera, into search in the continuous space because you're trying to find the theta values how to change the theta values, and those are continuous vectors. And so you have to somehow do a search over the continuous space. And that normally is where you get your calculus. And then uh, we ended, we talked about gradient descent, and we talked about the fact that you know, normally you take the partial derivatives at the point, and then move in the direction opposite to the partial derivatives if you want to minimize the error. And if you want to maximize something, so in fact, it turns out that one of the other things we'll see is we'll look at machine learning from multiple perspectives during this course. In this part of the lecture, we'll be talking about loss functions and error functions, and you want to minimize the loss. You want to minimize the error. Right? Obviously, what part of error don't you understand when you think of it should be minimized and maximized? Nobody wants to maximize their error. right? But on the other hand, you can also look at all these algorithms from a statistical perspective, and then you start thinking in terms of likelihoods. And the likelihoods have been maximized. But the theory is the same. You know, if you have gradient, you do gradient ascent, you get to maximize. You do gradient descent, you get to minimize. OK? Um, so and then we ended with this newton raphson method, which is sort of the most obvious place to start from. And if you use newton raphson method, then you don't need this alpha factor, which is a hyperparameter about how much of a move to make in the direction. You see what I'm saying? That's the learning rate. Because newton raphson method actually uses the second derivative directly. Except it turns out that the second derivatives for multi-variable functions, of the only, which are the only ones we are interested in, um, where multi-variable, so the thing that's different about basically machine learning, data science, blah, 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 and the old calculus that you did is whenever you said multi-variable, you meant two or three variables. Okay, it wasn't one, it's two or three. That's it. Okay, 
but really most of the time here we will be talking about multivariable where the variables can be millions. Okay, it can be hundreds, it can be thousands in your life and it can be millions too, okay, in terms of number of features that you have. Okay, and so that winds up actually becoming quite an interesting question. In fact, even understanding how the intuitions that you have about low dimensions, whether they even carry out or not to high dimensions, is a very interesting question. Okay, but suffice it to say that in this particular case, even for two dimensions, already f double dash, which is the uh, second derivative, it's not a single number. It is a matrix of numbers. Okay, and it's, uh, the matrix size, the Hessian, would be n square, where n is the number of dimensions. And so if you are in a one dimension, it's actually matrix of size one, <coughs> one by one. Otherwise, it will be you know, two by two. And if you have 100 dimensions, 100 by 100 matrix. OK, and then instead of, in general, whenever you have a division by real numbers, if you have a matrix, you take the inverse of the matrix. How many of you have done linear algebra? OK, so all of that stuff will be useful. Obviously, so you would wind up taking um, you know inverse of the Hessian and multiply it by the gradient. That tells you the amount, the size of the step that you're supposed to do. So instead of an alpha, you actually have a dynamic step size because Hessian inverse um, will essentially be um, you know dependent on the place you are on the on the um, on, on the uh, function. Okay. So this is what we want to do, but obviously it turns out that that's too costly. Hessian inversion is very hard for large number of dimensions. And so instead, we will mostly play around with just a simple alpha, alpha times the gradient. Okay, And then we will consider, for example, changing the alpha once in a while. Okay, or use other things like momentum, ideas, etc., which all can be seen as, if only I could do this, they were not needed. But this idea doesn't work for large dimensions, large number of dimensions. OK. Um, when we are here, my, uh, let me ask you a following question. Um, so you know um, three-dimensional apples. Apples are three-dimensional. Right? If you peel the apple, epsilon peel has given up, come out. How much apple is left? So this original apple is 100%. After you peel, let's say, how much apple do you think will be left? Like 1%, 10%, 99%, what do you think? 99%, unless you have one of those really bad pillars. Right? What is a two-dimensional apple? Apples are spheres, as far as mathematics is concerned. Okay. Uh, so two-dimensional apple is a circle. So if you peel the circle, in a sense, you are taking its radius and it's reducing by epsilon. Okay, so at the volume of the circle is basically the area of the circle. Okay, so if you do epsilon less, then instead of pi r squared, you have pi r minus epsilon squared. If you peel an apple of three dimensions, instead of 4 by 3 pi r cube, it will be 4 by 3 pi r minus epsilon cube. You see what I'm saying? So if you consider an n-dimensional apple, an n-dimensional apple, okay, after peeling, it will have r minus epsilon as its, uh, uh, you know, radius, obviously, and before peeling, it had r its radius. So the question is, if you have a 10,000-dimensional 10, apple, and you peeled the apple, how much of the apple will be left? 1%, 10%, 25%, 99%, what? What do you think? Yeah, of course it's got possibly that. What do you think? How, how many of you have seen the 10,000 dimensional apple? <laughs> what sort of lives are you? <laughs> how many of you have seen a four dimensional apple? I'm really hoping for somebody. Yeah, okay, we should talk. You must, I want to take the same drugs you are taking. <laughs> you see, we are 
are stuck in three dimensions. <coughs> we are stuck in three dimensions. Physics is easy because physicists have to stuck basically deal with three dimensions maximum. Okay, data science people, machine learning people have to deal with any number of dimensions. While you can't visualize it at 1000 dimensional level, the math is the same. You see that if you were at the circle, it would have been r minus epsilon by r squared is the ratio of the area of the circle after peel versus before peel. If it is a cube, it would be this. It would be four dimensional, it would be that. It will be n-dimensional, it will be n. If n is 10,000, what do you think will happen to this? So this is a real number minus epsilon by the same real number. So this ratio is less than 1. If you take a number that's less than 1 and exponentiate it 10,000 times, what do you get? A big zero. So if you take a 10,000 dimensional apple, if you ever get one, you know, don't ever try to peel, because after the peel, there's no apple left. Did you understand what I just said? So you think that you have intuitions about high dimensions, because I know about one and two and three, I'm sure how much worse can it be, 10,000 dimensions. But it turns out none of us have good intuitions about high dimensions. High dimensional apples are all peeled and no core. Is what I'm saying? Okay, this is true for even two to three dimensions. If you're only cutting epsilon percentage, you know, if you take a slither of an apple which is circular and took an epsilon percentage out, you'll have more apple left there than when you took a three dimensional apple and took an epsilon peel out. The reason I'm saying this is anytime you think, ah, we understand data science, we understand machine learning, it's just high dimensional calculus, hit yourself on the back of your head. You have no idea. Uh, at least not from an intuitive sense. Okay? Um, there are other things. So, for example, high dimensional apples are all field no core, and also uh, that in high dimensions, uh, most pairs of vectors are perpendicular to each other. It turns out that if you randomly pick two vectors in high dimensions and you take their dot product, that will be close to zero. Very high probability. Again, I can prove this mathematically. You see what I'm saying? One more thing. One more thing, of course, is as you go into high dimensions, in a two dimensions, a minimum is sort of like this, right? In three dimensions, a minimum is like this as well as like this. Basically, it's like a nice deep ditch. Four dimensions, only that guy knows how ditches look. <laughs> One of the interesting questions that, with respect to the continuous search that people have wondered, is that, as I told you, there is no guarantee that you will find the best minimum. Many functions will have multiple minima, and gradient descent just gets you to the one of those minima. So more likely than not, you will get a local minimum, not a global minimum. So there are two ways in which you can make sure that gradient descent based search will actually find a global minimum, which is make the world be so. Making the world be so essentially says, I shall require that the function I'm trying to optimize is convex. What convex means is it only will have one minimum. It won't have any other minimum. And if there's only one minimum, you'll find that only minimum. You see what I'm saying? So many people in machine learning would for a long time essentially focus on convex learning because that's the place where uh, gradient-based search will find, whatever it finds will necessarily be the only minimum, so that's the global minimum. If on the other hand you take a normal function, if you don't put this convexity requirement, then you are likely to get stuck in some local minimum. There are no guarantees that you won't get stuck in local minimum. So for the, one of the biggest worries people had in trying to go out of convex learning 
uh, can, in the learning over convex functions is I'm pretty sure we'll get stuck in local memory. One of the things that you'll find as we go forward is, you know, deep learning at the multi-layer neural networks essentially say, to heck with all these guarantees, we'll do what are the best. We'll try to look for the minimum. And they seem to work. Seem to work is a bad way of measuring anything, but essentially they do seem not to give very bad answers in general. And the question then is, if there are so many minima, how come miraculously Gradient descent is finding the good minimum. A possibility is that it's not as easy as you think to have more than one minimum. Do you understand what I just said? If you are trying to have it in one dimension, in two dimensions, right, you can basically, this is the way the minimum occurs. The only way you can, uh, so in three dimensions, so, so on the other hand, you have things like this, where you will have a saddle point here. It's not a minimum. But if you have a saddle point, you know, basically gradient descent can slowly come out of it. If you fall into it, you'll come out of it. In three dimensions, there are more saddle points. In fact, the word saddle is made for that. Right, you know, if you think of horse saddles, how many of you have ridden horses? Okay, so if you have this, then basically it has to be the saddle has to be like this so that it will uh, be in shape with the horse and also be like this so that you are happy sitting on it. Right, so it turns out that that's in three dimensions, the saddle point is not a minimum. It's a maximum from the horse's point of view, minimum from your point of view. Did you guys get this? It was kind of hard to actually, get a second. It's kind of hard to actually construct a minimum because there are more ways you can construct things that are not minima in three dimensions. When you get to 10,000 dimensions, for it to be a real minimum, it has to be closed in all dimensions. Do you see what I'm saying? In, in the saddle point thing, it was closed in, basically, it wasn't closed in this direction, if you're thinking in terms of minimum. It was closed in this direction, but not in this direction. To, to actually construct a minimum for the gods who made this function, it would be very hard for them, because they have to close this in 10,000 ways, in all the 10,000 dimensions, so that will be a minimum. If it's open in one dimension, out of 10,000 dimensions. That would be like Death Star with that little hole. <laughs> Gradient descent will find its way out. Do you guys get my point? Okay, so it's not as, just as, you know, there are these intuitions that we carry along when we go to high dimensions thinking, you know, it's easy to get lots of, you know, I can easily make, you know, a two-dimensional function with multiple minimas, like that. So it should be just as easy in higher dimensions. In two dimensions, if you take a pair of vectors, they are not going to be perpendicular with a high probability. But in very high dimensions, they are, with high probability, going to be perpendicular. In two dimensions, if you peel an apple, in three dimensions, if you peel an apple, there's still a lot of apple left to eat. If you make the mistake of peeling an apple in 10,000 dimensions, you have no apple left. <laughs> it's these sorts of things that actually make, you know, for one reason, that's one of the reasons why high dimensional gradient descent still seems to work. Okay? There's a question, yes. Yeah, if you find out, let me know, we'll write a paper together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course not. Of course not. No, no. Okay. Okay. Um, unless you start putting extra constraints on the function. So for example, you can make the function be convex, in which case you'll have only one minimum. Okay. Uh, but they only, of the class of functions in the world, convex functions are just as upset. There are infinite number of convex functions, but most functions are not convex. Okay, yes? Are you trying to say that in higher dimensions, you say 
No, I'm just saying that we expected it to do much worse and they still seem to be doing okay. So what are some possible reasons? These are not theorems, but these are some intuitions as to why you don't expect. In general, if in fact your, your intuition is that the more the dimensions, the more the number of local minima, let's say, that would be a wrong intuition. In fact, as the number of dimensions increase, having minima is hard. It takes work. Okay? Anyway, so let's so having said that, so that's all that was our discussion about um, about high dimensional functions and also about um, uh, uh, gradient descent. So now I go back to what we were doing uh, last class, which is I'm trying to take you know uh, the state S J. State S J has uh, uh, some value currently um, according to what the the, the feature function says, where the feature function essentially is the state SJ is represented in terms of features F1 all the way to SK. And then you are hoping that there are some weights theta 0 up to theta k. You multiply these feature values, the feature values are real values. You multiply these feature values by these real values, you add them up, that will give you a, um, a number. So you're trying to then find the best fit theta i that will essentially be you know, used to represent the value function. Now what would be the best fit? It is something that will minimize the error. And so this is where the version, the word loss comes. So suppose you represented the value of sj um, using this feature v hat theta, which is basically you know, like this. And its true value according to you should be V of SJ. Then you want to make the difference be smaller. To make the difference smaller, normally you can just take the absolute value. What's the problem with the absolute value? Problem with the absolute value is that it's not differentiable. Because if you look at the absolute value function, it looks like this. You guys see that? And so at the point where they meet, that's not differentiable. Because coming from left, there's one slope. Coming from right, there's another slope. So differential is not well defined. OK, so mostly people try to go with squared error. Looking for minimizing the error. Instead of just minimizing the error, you go for minimizing the squared error. What's good about squared error? It will be like this. It's smooth. Okay. There will be typically also you'll find that half most of the time we'd like to minimize half the squared error. What does that mean? That you're keeping the other half for a rainy day? <laughs> no. If you minimize